I'm Benjamin, and uh, as maybe Peter, we're going to present the, the part of the talk. So we're going to present HeBeacon in the kernel and the operator. Um, so first, this is a follow-up of my talk from two years ago at the Zen. Um, it was, I was there presenting the HeBPF, how it was required, everything. Uh, there were a lot of use cases explaining why, and well, you should have a look at it. But for those who are not there, um, this is an overview of HIT BPF. Um, basically, HIT stands for Human Interface Device Disk. This is your mouse, your screen, your keyboard, tablet, joystick, gamepad, whatever you have on your desktop. And it's a step dispatch protocol, um, which by that has two things, which is the first one is the Hebrew port descriptor. Sorry for the size of the slide. Um, it, it describes what is the language of the device, and then whenever you have an event, you receive the in input report. And with eBPF, what we do is simply that we insert a BPF program with whatever event we receive, and we can change the look of the device by changing the report descriptor and by changing the way it behaves by changing the, input, uh, the input report. So the way it looks like uh, is like simple BPF programs, except that we made the assumption that you can only access the array of bytes. And given that we are transforming from one standard HID, uh, which is device based, into one other standard, which is HID, which is the same, it's really, really simple. We have these two fixed uh, report descriptor fixed up and uh, report event, and that's, um, that's just it. So, uh, HIDBPF was launched soon after FDC 2022, uh, and it went into a 6E kernel uh, in April 2023. And from then, not much happened for six to nine months, uh, because it was, I was explaining in the, in the talk, the time for everything to trickle down to distributions. But then, in November uh, 2023, um, a French artist, David Revoy, who has the link of, of his work out there, uh, wrote a post for us to say, how the kernel, um, how the kernel update broke my steps. So his problem was that um, Microsoft made a design decision a few years ago um, for the Tibet prefix update that, that you can use to draw stuff. Basically, usually, when, whenever you have a pen, you've got this uh, rubber at the other hand, and which is kind of replicated on pens. And for several reasons, sometimes you don't have that rubber, but designers like to do this. So they emulate that by pressing the second button on the pen. The problem is that they basically require a hardware maker to do that in the firmware instead of doing that in the user space pack, which means that from the view side, you just see that whenever you press on it, it's as if the pen was placed correctly, and we just then this user rubber event. So uh, David got a new tablet, and this tablet came with a new pen, and XP pen was slightly more creative, in which like they added the tail and eraser, but they forgot to remove the eraser part for the second button. So basically, it was completely useless to him. So, why did Ooh, sorry. Um, so this was sold in two days. Um, you see, but when I mean sold, I don't mean uh, I got a program, I get a patch, he had to compile stuff, and then he had to wait for six months to get his update and everything. I mean, it was sold totally for him, completely, uh, without having to um, reboot his. Uh, his machine without having to, um, uh, uh, I mean, it was completely stopped for him. Like, he could continue working on his workstation, upgrade his kernel, it was stopped. So, if you remember this slide from two years ago, that was, that was the process that I actually explained. So, basically, you have to identify the issue, you have to uh, create a new patch, you have to, you have, to have tests of which you did, and then I I provided the compilation output to David. It, he could directly put the patch into his patch system, and plug his device, replug his device, and tell me the result of the, result of the test. Which means that after three, four questions, so after that, uh, Peter over there had a problem with one of his devices, and uh, he was trying to fix it, and he fixed it with VDPF. And, and one day, he was able to write a full kernel driver for his device without having to crash his kernel in session. So, and after that, he, he sent me this, this conference. But it crashed, uh, this was 
the most enjoyable Canadian experience I've had working with the kernel. Um, and I wanted to share that with you because um, even if like I did hit BPF, but the whole BPF community did all the BPF stuff, and this is not some piece of software that you actually built. And so thank you very much for that. So what's new in the kernel? Uh, in 60, uh, we started with tracing, um, so this was integrating the kernel. Uh, in 6.7, uh, then we uh, added BPF logs in the, in the kernel directly. This was a requirement from two years ago. In 6.7, we also added new trace banks. Uh, in 6.7, we got a full stop re-implementation. I'll explain that later. In 6.13, uh, we got the key generic control. Um, the first thing that in 6.10 what happened was that we integrated the current fixes directly into the kernel tree. So this was a requirement, they are now in driver heat BPF pods. Uh, but the thing is that uh, they are not built by default and they are not loaded by the kernel itself directly. What we ended up doing is that they are loading by an external tool which is called UDEV heat BPF. Simply because I really hard to make this, uh, to make the kernel loading the BPF program that it was always some downfall. And then I realized that this was actually kernel module in the same way. The kernel is not loading the kernel module, in some way, but it actually asks an external tool to load the kernel module. So that's basically what I did. And so now you have the BPF object direct, uh, program directly into the kernel tree. So we have a not stream for them and they are kind of like normal development cycle. In 6.11, I realized that when I was working on the case, uh, I was having an issue with that uh, I was tapering over because like, it was not great uh, because I was receiving an event and I wanted to postpone the decision of the event. So I worked together with the BPF core community and I ended up working with uh, getting the BPF core queues in the kernel. So now you've got BPF core queues if you want to have a suitable context directly from a non slip server context. Um, it's a very rough API right now. Uh, you can only create the work queue, assign a callback to it, and start the work queue. You can't cancel it. Uh, you can't have it delayed work queues. Uh, if you want that, you can emulate them through a BPF timer plus a work queue. But it's a little bit rough and it seems to be working well, at least from my use case. Uh, but then I realized that I actually needed some suitable hooks within HitBPF, and for that I had a full rewrite of HitBPF because I was I was told to use Polkdot. I was a little bit skeptical at the beginning because like a full rewrite um, but actually it is truly amazing. I would like to thank a lot of the people who work on Polkdot because this is a great people's thing. Uh, it's um, much simpler, so much more powerful. Um, basically you get a very tiny little beast of the verifier within your subsystem, which means that you can say, I want to actually have this struct, I want to have this part of the struct to be uh, writable, and you can do so. It's just amazing. Uh, the nice thing also with the, that you provide is that uh, you don't have any more um, uh, any. I used to have a program that I would load uh, because of the tracing way, it was not very clear. So now, um, I don't have this anymore, which means that whenever you enable HitBPF into your distribution, there is no overhead whatsoever. Uh, so there is no reason to not enable it because it just allows you to fix your devices. In terms of results, what this allowed me to do, uh, I had a little bit, a bit of fun with the surface I it's a story knob, uh, it just doesn't do a lot of himself. But now I can actually enable or disable happy feedback with it by long pressing it. Uh, this doesn't seem like a lot, um, but actually previously what I, what I was doing for that is I would need to use a user space program to control this. So now I can put everything into the kernel, just click the program, done, and I've got a full working device. I would like also to fix some low tech devices, because this is a proprietary protocol on top of it. Um, there is BPF because like, I do have some non-easily reproducible issues, which are like kind of hard to, to, to do, and I can't ask people to log to the specific kernel version with debug enabled. Well, if I just provide them 
GPS program, we can just wait this for, for the bug to happen and then they can just come back to me. Also in uh, 6.10, I had new keyfunks. Um, so this is just a big conflict of what has been happening, what has been happening. Uh, the first one is the uh, hidden book report and trading book report. Uh, basically, whenever you get an event um, from the UI, it's, it's called an input report. And now what you can do is you can say, I will see that event, but I want to actually find two events instead, so I can actually multiply the events because, like for instance, uh, my mouse could send a mouse and a keyboard at the same time, but I want to send this event into two different reports. Uh, the second one is something that I that was missing from the from day one. It's the output report, so it's the other way around. You want to write something on the device. Uh, I was able to do it uh, with another mechanism in HID, uh, but this part was missing, so yeah, now it's there. Both of those, uh, we do have um, the same HID API roughly now in BPF that what we have in the HID subsystem, uh, which means that you can control most of the HID device directly with BPF right now. Just watching the camera. We are trying to move slight, slightly away from our initial approach, which was like we are just fixing heat devices and that's all. We realized that we would probably need some sort of control of the kernel because whenever you're fixing your device, you don't want the kernel to come back later at you and undoing everything you've been doing. So basically, we, we, we want to have a way to say, we've got our device, and this is the way it should behave, and you do not have to do anything else with it. Um, I'm going to leave the stage to Peter. He's going to talk about the US test. Hey guys, my name is uh, Peter Acker. So I'm going to be talking about uh, UDP PPS, which is the, the user space component of the whole thing, um, aka mod probe um, for PPS programs, just with a slightly more awkward name. Um, so UDP PPS is actually three things in the same repository. So we have a UDP PPF as a collection of PPF programs, some of which have already moved into the kernel. Um, we keep them around. Uh, UDP PPF is a binary executable, so the mod probe part of it, um, that we used to actually load the BPF programs, and, and it's a bit of scaffolding around the two, so we can actually um, provide the, the things that the distribution needs um, to actually load all the, the BPF programs. So like I said, it's a collection of uh, BPF programs, um, what you can see here, so we have three directories, we have stable, testing, and user hacks. Uh, stable is everything that's already moved into the kernel, we keep it around though. Um, testing is, if you have a broken device, you want to write a BPF program to fix it, you start in testing, you put it in there, we leave it in there for a while, eventually Benjamin compiles a patch that, that goes into the kernel. Once the kernel accepts it into like Linux Next or whatever, we move it into stable. So distributions can say, okay, we're always going to ship the stable ones, testing ones, up to the user if they want to install it or not. Um, Testing stable uh, for objectively correct fixes to objectively broken devices. So you have a device that says I have 16 buttons when physically it only has four. That is a fix we can put in there. Right? We have a third directory where user hacks. That is for subjective fixes. So you have a device. You want the middle button to do something else. Okay, that's fine. That's for you. That's where we can put. You can write a BPF. We can put it in there. So we have a few of those already. So that's the template for people who just want to do crazy stuff to their devices, like what Benjamin had with the little the, the rotary knob that he has. Um, so one example, the, the bottom one that's listed here is a foot pedal, about a two-foot pedal of Amazon. Um, when you press it, it drops key because that's a very important layout currently. Um, so we have a uh, PPF program that changes that B into control C, which is infinitely more useful already. But you can see that's only a template because someone else might want to type it in. Um, those ones will never be upstream to the kernel, so they're just sitting around. If you can look at them, it's quite, I think that took two hours to write. Um, so they're just going to stay there for people to, to adjust and install locally. Um, yeah, so the second thing, the BPPF is a binary explorer. I'll get to that, I'll get to that in about three slides, four slides. Um, so uh, the second thing, UDP PPF is a binary executable. So this is the, the mod probe or ins mod part. So in the most simple case, you say UDP PPF add, you provide the specific path to the device, you provide the PPF that you want to load, 
it gets loaded in, we map the various things that we need to map we pin it date it where the device is fixed um, if it's written in Rust which means it's actually compiled which is open for us because PPF can be loaded that we pre-compile can be loaded onto any any kernel more or less um, we statically compile it which means the, the use with a broken device we can just point them at this is the CI pipeline that includes the things. At the end of the CI pipeline, there's a zip file that contains the pre-compiled binaries. You unzip that on your machine, you run UDEF PPF install, which generates a UDEF rule on the fly for that particular device. That gets put in a file system, user plugs in the device, the device is fixed. If it's not, at least it didn't crash the kernel, which is a good user experience. Really. Um, very importantly, UDEF PPF. Uh, is a generic loader. There is no skeletons of PPF programs compiled into UDP PPF. It's, a, it's just a loader that doesn't know about anything of the actual BPF. Um, the way we, we do that is the BPF programs themselves contain all, all the information that we need um, to know which device we need to load for. So we have a macro at the top, which is an approach we have stole from top deck, I think. Um, uh, in, in the BPF program, you declare, I want to attach to the USB device with that map vendor ID, that map product ID. You list all those. We can, during the build process, we can extract that information. We can generate the user rules, the hardware database entry sends on, all of that. Um, and we can then provide that together with the actual binary, with the BPF program for distribution to install. So UDP BPF, the binary executable, doesn't need to know about anything. About the BPF, we can extract all that during build time and at runtime. Um, so this is the example. So that's the usual, um, the corresponding hardware database entry. You get if you have 5,000 BPFs, you get all that hardware database. This is distant the approach. If you're not familiar with it. That's commonly used for these things already. Um, so we're not inventing anything new here. Um, who details on how it works? Uh, answer the question on the prefix. Um, we have all the programs that are in UDP BPF, which is external to the kernel, um, have a simple prefix thing. Uh, whenever there's an incompatible uh, kernel change for the API, we just bump it to 20. Um, we go up like that. UDP BPF by default, when this distribution installs all the BPF, it will just load them in reverse numerical order. So you have a, a kernel, UDP BPF, you plug your device in, UDP BPF goes, but it says, oh, there's a 50 file, does it load? No. There's a 40 file. Is closed? No. Is it 30? Is it locked? Yes. That's the one you're going to get. Which means that no matter where you install it, you get the, the most recent PPF with the most recently supported versions on your kernel. And if someone else who runs a more modern kernel might get the 50 file. So whichever one is the most, most recently one. It also means that we don't necessarily need to care that much about older versions of it because they're basically frozen in time. Um, this applies to the one we have in our repository here. Um, doesn't need to happen for the ones that are in the kernel because they can be updated together with the kernel. Um, we can pass in UDEF properties as variables. If a BPF declares a variable, um, prefix with UDEF prop, um, UDEF BPF, the, the loader, will check if that property is set when it loads, and if so, it will copy the value into the BPF program. The BPF program can then use that to configure itself. Um, we use that already for Huion devices. Huion has this great idea of sharing, I think, four product IDs across about 50 devices, which means in, in user space it's actually impossible to tell which one of those tablets that product ID is. But you can extract a magic byte string from the tablet if you know what you need to do. So we, um, we have a separate tool that sets that as a user property. It means we can have a BPF program that not only attaches to the product ID, but then can check that match string to know am I the right BPF program for that particular uh, device. So we can have about five BPF programs that all attach to the same product ID, but only one of them attaches to that particular device. Um, and finally, um, very conveniently, we can have PyCare star BPF objects. So we just recompile them as shared libraries. We have a, a small wrap button around it. We throw a few Python signals at it, and then we can write PyTest for the BPF programs to make sure that it actually keeps working. So this is a fairly, I don't know if you've, met, if you've uh, done PyTest tests before, um, very convenient. We just load it, we compile the uh, hit report, we throw it at the BPF, we read what comes back out, 
and we can use all the power of PyTest to parameterize the condition we filter the test depends on and so forth. Very convenient. Um, it's already uh, shipping in Fedora 40. Um, it will be in uh, RHEL 10 as well. And our kind of plans is that most of the devices in the future that just need simple fixes will use that approach. So um, you mentioned uh, it's all the way at the beginning of the presentation. You managed that you switched to desktop for uh, uh, for Linux. So how does that work with patching? Because from what I know, you you you, cu you currently need to load it as the file script of the program to the, to a separate physical file program, and then use a special case pump to load it. It takes a program file script and not like the struct of is a, is a map with multiple programs in it. Yeah, so, so what we what we do uh, is that within the struct of itself, uh, we do add a field um, that says this is the device ID that I want, and each e device has its own device ID. So whenever you load the struct of, you can change it before you actually, uh, when you open the struct of, you can change it before you load it. And then whenever you attach the script ops, that there is a DBPF call to attach the script ops. Then directly it calls the registry to register the version within the kernel, and then the kernel looks at this ID, check if the ID matches one of the currently available devices, and then it will attach it to it. But does that mean you no longer need a separate syscall program to, to actually attach it with the... No, I mean, it's, it's just all magically done by the DPS. All, all work by the Yeah. Awesome. Great. I mean, that's me. That's very simple. Oh, okay. So, um, since it's already using a um, switched uh, DBPF price library, DBPF price, or something else? Um, we are. We are using uh, libdpf first to build the uh, to build the dpf. Yeah. It, within the kernel, uh, they are just using this regular make. I think it's the same make file line that we have in the bpf set. So. Yeah. I mean, we just well, just because we didn't have like any feedback for dpf for us uh, maintainers. I mean the. The, the way, I mean, for the BPF, the BPF has worked just fine. It just in cargo builds, it just builds. So that's good. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, in terms of API, it's, I think there is a few missing um, one to one mapping between the BPF and the BPF RS, but that's just negligible and it's like, yeah, because the scheduling system is fast uh, loaders. So, uh, unlike Hit BPF they have given like a lot of skeleton like so there is like all like skeleton adjustments into like Rust style and then the type. So there was a lot of like feedback and back and forth and feature requests on that side. It sounds like that you, you I think you mentioned that you're not doing like any skeleton stuff, so it's like just a program and just load it's done. So you don't really the only thing you modify is this ID. Yeah. Uh, and then so the, the, the only thing that we actually do and uh, where we would, it's, it's kind of like just a BPF requirement is whenever we want to, uh, to fill in those UDF properties, because we don't have the skeletons, we don't have the BPF available or yeah. where the properties. <laughs> you put it on zero. Yeah, so it's kind of like uh, doing, I mean, looking at everything, it's, it's not that great, but it's, we ended up doing it before. So. And save files. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.